All right, people are still filing in, but I think we can start. So let me just start my timer so I don't bore you guys for two hours. So I'm, I'm Norbert, and this is uh, Babelfish's data. Who knows what a Babelfish is? OK, so we have like one bookworm. So in, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you learn basically two things. You learn that when you're traveling, you always must bring a towel, and that a Babelfish is a really cool device because you put it in your ear, and it translates all alien languages so you understand. It's like an ideal Google Translate, but it actually works, right? So the theory is that uh, data is the Babel fish of programming. That if you work with data instead of with objects or with other things, it turns out that you can talk to d different systems that are written in different languages, and you can also write simpler systems that you can maintain yourself. At least that's the theory, right? But we need to take a step back, and I need to talk about scurvy. So who knows what scurvy is? This is uh, in Polish. This is szkorbut. Right. This is this terrible disease. Sorry. This is terrible disease where your teeth start falling out and your your skin is really pale and basically your body is slowly disintegrating and then you die. And scurvy is a really interesting disease. Um, I take it back. Scurvy is a terrible disease if you have it and you suffer from it and you die. But it's an interesting disease because it's solely caused by a deficiency of vitamin C. So you would think it, it wouldn't be such a big problem, right? Because it's, vitamin C is everywhere. But it turns out that. Scurvy has been with us since basically people have been able to write about it. Because what would happen is people figured out that they need to eat certain foods, and then they would be healthy for several generations. And then someone would forget why their grandma or grand-grandma told them to eat a certain food, and then several generations would pass, and people would get scurvy. Because they would for honestly forget that there was a reason why they were eating certain foods to begin with. And the most recent incarnation of this, from our perspective, is in the 15th century. And this is why scurvy is uh, considered a sailor's disease, is because in the 15th century, you had sailors traveling on large uh, open waters for long periods of time, right? And so people, would get, people didn't have access to fresh uh, food, and they would get scurvy, and they would die. And in the 18th century, this was basically a solved problem, because people figured out, the captains, of, and the captains, of course, that as long as we bring lemons on board and feed these sailors lemons with their grog, then people don't die of scurvy, so everything's perfectly fine. And this would have been the end of the story if it wasn't for the fact that in the 19th century, for geopolitical reasons, limes were a lot cheaper than lemons. And so people replaced limes with lemons, but the problem was that the way they manufactured the lime juice was different than the way they manufactured the lemon juice, and the limes had no vitamin C. So essentially, by accident, we reintroduced scurvy into the Navy. But another thing happened. In the 19th century, we introduced steamboat power. So ch trips that used to take three months now took three weeks. And even though people got sick, they didn't have enough time to be on the open water to realize it. So the cause and effect was lost. People didn't realize that scurvy was introduced back into the system. And it wasn't until the late 19th century that we realized that this was again a problem because people started traveling to the Antarctic. Right? They did polar expeditions. And so again, you have long, long trips. Uh, without access to fresh food, people start getting scurvy again. Th you thought it was a solved problem, and it's not. The real problem was, in the late 19th century, in the medical community, all the hipsters and all the buzzwords was about bacteria. Everything was caused by bacteria, because that was the main thing that people knew about. And so their reasoning was that people are dying on these expeditions to the, pol uh, to the uh, poles, to the start North and South Pole, because there's bacteria in their food. So all the meat was canned, basically spam, and all the juices and all this other stuff that provided the nutrients, they were boiled multiple, multiple times over to kill the bacteria. But that ended up killing the vitamin as well, right? So basically what ended up happening is we ended up killing these people over and over again because we didn't realize that we need vitamin C, right? And it wasn't until 1932 that someone actually realized and extracted the vitamin C and said, this is, this is vitamin C, and this is why people are dying of scurvy. And then it was finally, finally solved. But it's an interesting tidbit of history, but why the hell are we talking about it at a programming conference, right? So the theory is that we as an industry are suffering from scurvy. In the 1930s, we introduced lambda calculus. By the 60s and 70s, we have basically all of modern computing because we have functional programming, logic programming, constraint programming, declarative programming. We have relational databases. We have garbage collectors. We basically got everything that we have in the modern age. Right? They basically invented it all in, by the 70s. But then the 80s happened. In the 80s, what happened was we had the AI winter. Right? People realized that you can't build a, a artificial intelligence as, as good as data from Star Trek. And people just blamed the programming languages. So 
in the 90s, we introduced object-oriented programming, right? The Lime. The problem is that we didn't, this is not, you know, this is not Smalltalk and Eiffel. This is, you know, Java and C++. <laughs> Essentially, it looks like the same fruit, but it isn't, because we basically reintroduced Scurvy into our projects. Our projects are not able to ship correctly on time, and all, you know, they're full of bugs. We used to be able to land on the moon, and now we can't even deploy a website without it crashing half the time. Something has gone terribly wrong. The problem is that we're focused on washing our hands. And I'm not saying washing our hands is bad, you know, TDD, Agile, Scrum, all this other stuff. It's good, it's okay, but it doesn't help you fight scurvy because for scurvy you need vitamin C. And, and data, data is the vitamin C of programming. Because the cool thing about functional programming is not that functions are first class citizens. The cool thing about functional programming is that data is treated as a first class citizen. That's where all its power comes from. People don't realize it though at first, right? It's not a really good selling point, you know, just work on data. What we, used to, what we do used to be called data processing. Now, I know you can't call yourself a data processor nowadays because you can, will never make as much money as a software developer, an architect, or a craftsman, right? But you are essentially just a data processor. And the sooner you realize this, the better you, the systems you will build. Because we all build information systems. And an information system is nothing more than this, big, this, this black box where there is chaos outside. And the chaos is basically all the outside world events. And at some point, we take this chaos and we order it. We put it into our system, we store it, and we save it for future reference. And what happens is at some point in the future, a user comes by and asks for relevant information. And all we can do is we can just spit out that data back. That's all we do. We just store data and we spit it out. We might aggregate it, make it into a nice report, but basically that's all we do. We, we're just the, we just build these chickens that just, just eat and poop over and over again. And once you realize this, you can start building systems because with this realization, systems become a lot simpler. Because all you really need is streams, trees, and meshes. That, all systems are just built with these things. Everything else is just unnecessary complexity. A stream is just an ordered data, right? right? Because these three, these three things introduce very different semantics, and that's why there must be three of them. A stream semantics is that there is order. That's all it means. It's, it could be a queue, it could be whatever you want, but basically it just introduces order into our system. A tree is what all of your UIs are built out of. It doesn't matter if you're mobile, web, desktop, or you're you know, like data scientist, and all you end up doing is reporting, generating some Excel sheet at the end. All you're basically generating is a tree of data that happens to be displayed as a UI. And graphs. Graphs are the third bit, right? This is where all your business data lies. We often forget that the business data we have is a graph. It's not a tree, it's not a relational database, it's a graph. There's interdependencies. And actually, it's not even a graph, it's something that I like to call a mesh. Because with, in all the systems I've worked up to this point, all systems have basically been a mesh in the sense that there was only about three to four core business objects that describe your domain, and everything is, else is just a relationship. Right? So take Spotify, for example. Right? Everyone is aware of how Spotify works. Spotify really has three core objects. It has listeners, artists, and songs. That's all it has. Because an album is, you have these three objects, listeners, uh, artists, and songs, and an album is just an edge in the graph, a relationship between an artist and multiple songs, to which you attach some metadata. The metadata is things like titles, when it was published, and so forth. If you have a playlist, that's a relationship between a user and certain songs. If I subscribe to someone's playlist, I am now creating yet another new edge between that playlist I just created and another listener. And what happens with every single feature you add to a system, it becomes denser and denser. That's, all, that's, that's why I call it a mesh, because the more legacy code you have, the denser your mesh is, because there's even more features that are just working on the relationships between existing things in your system. This is why a lot of people fail with microservices, because they take a monolith, which has n plus 1 SQL queries, and they convert it to microservices, which now are just n plus 1 HTTP queries. Because every feature needs all that data, right? And, and you just dispersed it all over the system. But there is another way to build these systems. But you have to realize that streams, trees, are meshes. You, it doesn't matter what programming language you use. It doesn't matter what architecture you decide to build it in. You need to understand that your architecture needs to give you the ability to quickly switch contexts between these three things. If you can't do all three of these, you're going to be screwed sooner or later. Right? This is not that talk. As in, I'm not going to describe this in detail, but if you're interested, Lambda architecture is an example of how you would build this in the large. Right? This is like what LinkedIn does. 
Datomic and Samza are both examples of how you build databases using exactly the same idea, the same architecture. And a lot of the stuff you see in the user interface is things like uh, Facebook's GraphQL and Relay, uh, the Elm language, basically a lot of stuff that's happening in ClojureScript. They're taking these ideas and they're using this exact same pattern to build systems in this way. And it, it really does work. Because we all build distributed systems. And there's one thing about distributed systems is that they need to communicate. And there's something that communicates very well over the wire, and that's data. And there's something that communicates very terribly over the wire, and that's objects. Because objects need to pass their context around. And that doesn't serialize well. So let's talk about data. Data is really three things. It needs to be immutable, semantic, and recursive. Right? Immutable by definition, because data is information at rest. Information at rest cannot change by definition. Right? Just because I'm here talking to you today, I'm somewhere else talking tomorrow, it doesn't change the fact that I was standing here and talking to you today. Right? Data is facts. Facts are information at rest. They're immutable. But they also must be semantic. We're striving to build a system out of small Lego pieces. If there are two pieces in our system, there needs to be a good reason for their existence. If they have the same semantics, they can be modeled by the same data pattern. So you don't need two of them. But since we simplify our schema to only a set of very simple semantic blocks, we also need recursion in order to build them back up to much larger systems. So this was really abstract. Let's look at some examples. So data are things like scalars, right? Things like numbers, strings, booleans, maybe some form of identity is kind of useful sometimes, right? That's, that's all you really need to model, model basically the world. Uh, but then you need collections to group these kinds of things together, right? So things like lists, maps, and sets. Actually, these are the only three you need because lists give you the semantics of an order, maps give you the semantics of a key value association, and sets give you the, the operations of mathematical sets, all, those, all the semantics you would need. There's a little caveat, and that's there's homogeneous and heterogeneous collections, right? So things are the same in the in collection or not. And there's a reason why I want to make this distinction. You'll, you'll, I'll, I'll get back to this later. So that, that was data, and now we're going to look at code, <laughs> right? Because what's the point of just looking at this abstract stuff? Now, I know, I know closure is kind of scary, but APL is really scary. But I asked, anybody do APL in production? As far as I can tell, not a single hand goes up. So the good news is you will understand the slides, because unless you do APL for a living, and instead you do Ruby, C Sharp, Java, um, .NET, Python, whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, uh, my slides are so simple, you basically have the exact same semantics in your languages, and you should start applying these rules to them. Because Clojure gives you things like scalars, right? Things like numbers, strings, booleans, a nil concept, right? Just like in your favorite language. Closure gives you identity. Now, this might be something you don't have in every single language. Ruby and Lisps have it, for example. Um, it's the, it, identity is just a useful concept to have in language. It's this the way of just being able to say that um, if, there's, if there's two things that are called the same keyword, then they have, uh, they're actually identical right, in the system, like even in the garbage memory. But that's, that's not super important. By the way, if any Ruby programmers here, um, Ruby got it wrong. Ruby has symbols as keywords and keywords as symbols. I have no idea why they math split that, but everyone else does it this way. <laughs> and closure has collections, right? So again, semantics. We have lists, which give you order, maps, which give you association, and sets that give you sets. And that's all you really need, with two caveats. First caveat, why does closure have lists and vectors? Right? Why are there two things? You said that one is enough for semantics. Well, the thing is, Semantics, you don't need more semantics than this, but for performance reasons, you often need many kinds of collections, right? So this is the, that sort of example. You're going to have vectors, priority queues, assorted sets, tuples, all this kind of stuff. The semantics are identical. In, a, in, in, a, in, in the world, in fact, you could replace a, one data structure with another data structure that has the same semantics, and the program should still be correct. It just might not you know, run the way you want or run out of memory or something along those lines, right? So it's important to make that distinction. There are many data structures, but they always come back to those three semantics. The other caveat is, remember what we were talking about homogeneous and heterogeneous? Maps are an ideal example of where this, the semantics are very different. Because the top example is a heterogeneous map, which is basically just a bag of data, right? It's a bag of data for a user profile. Like these are the keys and these are the values. And the bottom map has very different semantics because it's an index. It's an index of usernames to a favorite language, right? It has very different semantics, and we will make that distinction in the future. So everything you've seen up to this point, 
I think we're all agreed you have in your language, right? So nothing new here. This is the first bit of foreign code. So bear with me. We have parentheses. We have a plus. The first argument is always the variable, uh, the verb, and the rest are arguments, right? So you evaluate the plus with the arguments, six. So the nice thing about Lisp is that you can quote the expression, which returns the original data structure. So it returns the list, which is nice because you can do things like operations on it, right? You can count how many things are in that thing you were supposed to evaluate. And now everyone knows Lisp. Congratulations. <laughs> Right. So really, there's, there's nothing more to it. I mean, obviously, Clojure has a bit more than that. Uh, I, like to, I like to always think of Clojure as the language that was designed to let programmers steal. Because basically what happens, every time any programming community has a really good idea, Clojure has a library implemented in, with it in the, in the next three months. So all over here on the bottom, basically, Core Async is a re-implementation of CSP. So that's your Go programming language. Core logic is prolog, so there's your prolog. And core typed is a library that implements strong static typing, as you see in ML and Haskell language. All right. So basically, anytime you have a good idea, Clojure is going to steal it. And on top of it, Clojure runs on the JVM, on the CLR, and on the JavaScript virtual machine. Right. The only difference between this and this is that it interops with JavaScript. Right. You get all the benefits. Right. This is why I program with ClojureScript. But this is not that talk. I am not here to convince you of Clojure Script. I'm here to talk about Clojure Spec, which is the most recent thing that Rich Hickey and friends stole, this time from Racket Scheme and Academia. So Clo Clojure has one, had one problem, because not everyone wanted to use uh, core typed, which is a strong static typing that you would have in ML. And so they stole a different idea from Racket Scheme, which is our dynamic language, which is what would happen if we could do really strong data contracts at runtime? Right. So the, the idea is, um, if you have a dynamic system, but you still want to describe the data that's passing through it, how would you do it? And it turns out that academia has been working on this for a while. And by the way, if someone's interested, there are some really crazy papers out there where uh, uh, people try to prove that you can write uh, a data contract, strong static typer, that basically, s that basically proves that you don't have, for example, race conditions in a distributed system. Right? So there, there are crazy ideas out there. Uh, this is one of the saner ones. And so what it basically is, is imagine you have your entire runtime over here, and there's like, a, there's like this line in the sand. So you have your entire JVM or whatever, and it's running all of your code. And then on the other side over here, somewhere like completely separate, I start writing declarations about data. The way you would document, document your system. You would just say that this API expects an integer and returns this. Or this API expects an integer and the integer must be over 18 and all this kind of other stuff. The trick is that you can declare this data and not attach it to any specific thing running in your system. It's completely independent. What happens is you declaratively define specifications once. And then there's a bunch of useful functions where you can apply that knowledge to multiple things, right? So instead of trying to explain this waving my hands around, I'm just going to show you some code. So this is how you start any closure program. You always, everything in closure is in the namespace. So the first thing we do is we require a closure spec as a library and alias it to s. So we can use it for future reference. So the first thing that sort of spec gives you is def, right? So def has two, two, con two things here. There's a right side and a left side. The right side is the specification, right? So in this case, it's a very simple specification that's just a, a predicate that says, is this an integer, true, false? And the thing on the left is an arbitrary name that I've defined, right? I'm just going to call, I'm just going to make the specification integer, and I'm going to call it an int for, just to make it easier for future self, right? So I'll use it later, and I won't have to write out the whole specification. Now, this double colon thing, feel free to ignore this for the rest of the presentation. It's just shorthand. It just means use the current namespace, because everything in Clojure, including the, the specs, are namespaced. So you can use them globally. So one of the most obvious things you can do with this kind of thing is ask if certain data is, meets the specification you ask for, right? So a 10 is indeed an integer, so it's true, and a string is not an integer, so it's false, right? Notice that the important thing is I am not creating a type of integer as 10. This is just arbitrary data and an arbitrary specification, right? So you can ask multiple different specifications the same data and sort of, and, and vice versa. So, I mean, that's not particularly interesting, right? We have validation libraries basically in every language. 
What is kind of interesting, though, is that you can compose very well, right? So and and is the ability to do composition on specifications. So and says that make sure that it is an int, well, however that was before defined, and that's also even, right? So now four is still true, a string is still false, and also three is false because three is not even; it's odd. So that's kind of nice because not many validation libraries give you composition very easily, but What's the, thing, what, what's the thing about validation libraries, if anybody has ever used one, I'm sure you all have. It's, it's nice when it gives you a true-false, but then you ask it why it went wrong, right? And it turns out that you usually end up writing a bunch of error messages yourself because the messages are useless. So spec gives you explain. And explain basically just takes the specification and the data you asked for and explains exactly why it failed. So four fails because a string is not an integer, and three fails because it's even, not even, it's odd. Now this may seem primitive and simple, but if you've ever worked with a two megabyte JSON file and all your system told you was that it doesn't, it's invalid, that's, that's kind of useless, right? The nice thing about spec is because it understands the shape of your data, it will tell you exactly where in that humongous JSON file something went wrong and exactly why, which is priceless information for debugging. Another thing you have is or, right? Um, I don't know if now is the right time to mention it, but basically closure spec implements all of a mathematical regular expressions. So you have concatenation, recursion. Basically, you can define, you can do anything you can do with mathematical regular expressions. So or or is branching, right? In a regex, it's saying it's either this or it's that. So here we define something called even or odd, and it's either even or odd, and there's a certain specification for both. So if you ask it even or odd three, true, even or odd four, uh, true, both are true. But that's not particularly interesting. What is interesting is usually when you write. Um, you write some validations. For example, let's say you're writing uh, some API request, uh, API um, endpoint. You validate a bunch of data that comes in from your user, and the moment it's true, what do you do? You end up writing all that same logic again, because all of that logic you needed to parse the JSON payload to get to that point to make sure that that thing was an integer that you expected to be an integer, it just returned true false. You have to then go and do the exact same parsing one more time to actually get the value back, right? Once you actually confirm that the entire payload is valid and, and there's no you know, miscreants in the process. So spec gets rid of that because it understands the data shape. So it'll give you something called conform. In the case of or, what it does is it tells you what branch you followed to get to that data part, right? So even is odd, uh, three is odd, even is four. So what branching, what conform does for an or, it, it just returns the branch it went on, so you can, for example, pattern match on that later, and it returns the final data. Now you might be asking, why does it give me the data? I know what data I put into the system. That seems kind of silly. Well, the problem is that, remember, composition all the way down, you can have many transformations that you're not aware of. So I know this is a bunch of code, but just focus on this part. We, we took that same even or odd example and we expanded it. Now, inside of the even branch, we're going to do an and composition. First, we're going to check it's even, and if it's, this is still valid, we're going to multiply times 100 and convert it to a string, right? And so, now you notice that the conform does a lot more. Basically, it validates. If it's invalid, it tells you why it's invalid. Otherwise, it transforms all the way down. So, you basically can build a very easy data pipeline using something very similar to an either monad, right? But that's not all, as they say in the TV ads. If you have the data, as in your program understands the data shape, why don't you just tell the, the program to generate the data for you, right? And that's exactly what exercise is. Exercise says, I know what data you're expecting me to give you, so the left side of this, so this is just saying generate me four samples. And, and basically what's happening here is the left side is going to be the input to that transformation, to, to that uh, spec, and the right side is the final output. Right? And it's only going to give you valid data. So it's amazing how useful this is, but it's one of those things that I can't really explain because you don't realize how much you missed this until you've had it and then it's gone. But we, do, we use this for everything from testing to generating you know, like entire UIs to doing lots of other really cool stuff. So let's, we need to talk about collections, I think, as well. So in order to talk about collections, let's define some more things. Right? So, I'm just going to define a bunch of programming languages and then a couple user attributes, age, name, and language. 
right? Like your favorite language, a user profile, you could say. So remember we were talking about heterogeneous and homogeneous maps. So a homogeneous map is one where it's an index of A to B, always. So a map of, uh, so user lang is an index of, uh, that maps from username to user language, right? So if you exercise this, what you get is you get a bunch of strings as keys and a bunch of languages of values. By the way, th I'm, I'm gonna show these examples as exercises, but everything I, I showed about validation and stuff, this is all still true, remember. You write the spec once, and then you have a bunch of functions you can do cool things with. So that's map of, but there's also keys. And keys is the heterogeneous version. So here we generate a user profile, and we tell it username and user language are required keys in this map, and a user age is optional. So if you exercise it, what happens is sometimes it'll give you a map with age and sometimes it won't, right? Because they're optional. And when it validates it, if user age doesn't exist as a key, it's still valid. But if user age does exist, it better be valid with the specification you gave it. Now notice one cool thing about this. This is something you don't see, I haven't seen in any other uh, kind of library for validation and, and typing and stuff. It's that here, the only thing we're talking about is what keys are required in this map or optional in this map. Expected, basically. It says nothing about the values of those keys because the values of those keys, if they're defined somewhere, is via that unique, uh, unique uh, specification, right? So we've completely separated what it means for something to be a username from where it can actually be used. In this case, it's used in a profile link. So coming back to that, uh, why we have that separation, collection of, uh, we're going to talk about collection of. So if you remember, this is the old user language. It maps to a single name, right? So a user can be only know a single language. This is, of course, invalid. We are all polyglots. So now a user language is a collection of programming languages and specifically a set of them, right? What that means, though, is we've redefined this specific um, specification spec, but we haven't touched any of the other ones. The other ones, as a in direct consequence, though, get the updated data. So if you now exercise the map, the index, you get a, a string and a set of languages. And if you exercise the profile, you get a set of languages, right? These guys don't know that I've redefined user lang. We've completely d separated what it means for what it means for user lang to exist as a, as a value and where it is used in the system. So this is a slide I'm not going to really cover, but um, as I wanted to point out, spec is a complete regular expression uh, parser, so you can actually spec out closure itself, like the language, and it's actually something that's happening right now. So very soon, um, all syntax errors and things of that nature will be using closure spec. So closure is able to type check its own syntax, right, and give you really nice errors that you've made this mistake here exactly. The last thing I want to touch on is uh, fdef. Now, it really doesn't matter for you to look at the specific uh, the code we're interested in. We're only interested in the following uh, things. There's a function adder somewhere in our runtime. Because notice that we're constantly declaring these uh, specifications outside of where we're actually using them. So I just know that somewhere in our runtime, we have an adder function. And after the fact, I'm going to add some, uh, some constraints, some, 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 some assertions about what this function does. So I can use args to tell me, to tell the system that adder has these certain uh, properties for the inputs, for the, uh, for the arguments. I can possibly specify certain outputs, like what are the return values and why, like, you know, very specifically. Or I can even write a crazy function that is a relationship between the inputs and outputs. Now these are all optional, right, of course. But the nice thing about it is, if you do go out of your way to write out this document, Basically, this is documentation, right? The only difference is, because this is like documentation you would end up writing for your public API anyway, the only difference is that this is actually runnable code. And you can use that to your advantage. Spec instrument basically says, this is something you would enable in your development and staging environment. It says, everywhere you spec out certain functions, I'm gonna make sure that those assertions are correct, right? So any input you give, it'll automatically throw you an error or like a log a warning or whatever that you're using this function not as expected, or if the return value is not what the function expects, it'll throw you an error that, you know, uh, this function is not implemented as it should be. Now that's nice, because it's something you can run in staging and then completely disable in production, so you don't have a pr uh, any sort of performance uh, cost. 
But even even nicer is test check. Because, test, because once we've gotten to this point, the question is why the hell are we doing any work at all? We told the computer what to expect. Test check basically finds all those functions, takes the argument specifications, generates arguments for you, runs those functions, and checks that the results are what you expected it to be. So essentially, you let your software write and run your unit tests for you, right? And, and the thing is, uh, the, the computer can generate you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of tests, and you can only generate 100 if you're good, and someone doesn't yell at you for writing too many tests. That brings us to general property testing. Who here has heard of general property testing? Awesome. That's good, because it means you might actually learn something today from me. <laughs> By the way, has, does anyone know what that is? So this is one of my, this is a, uh, I really like this painting. It's, it's Salvador Dali's painting. It has a really long title. I can never remember correctly. But basically, it's a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. So for those people sitting way in the back, what they see is they see a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. And those people sitting way in the front, they see a naked lady in a gala. And if you guys in the front are curious, this is what they see in the back. That small Abraham Lincoln. Right. This has absolutely nothing to do with programming, right? This is just a four dev, bam, art education. So let's talk about quick check. Um, sorry, but my throat's you. <laughs> it was a long before party. So um, quick check was invented by uh, by John Hughes and God, a second guy. I can al I always forget his name, so I'm sorry. Second guy who invented quick check, um, and it was originally designed for Haskell. And what it does essentially is, it says. Let's let the computer write our tests for us. So what happens is you write assumptions and you write axioms about your system that always must hold true, right? There are certain things that always are true in your system, so you write those out, and then what happens is your computer generates hundreds of thousands of tests that randomly run your code and make sure that those assertions are still valid always. Quick check was ported to, from Haskell to every single programming language I can think of. So whatever your programming language is, just type in Google, favorite language, quick check, and you will find a port. There's only a couple things that you need to know if you want to start using this in practice. Number one, um, your quick check library needs to generate data in some way. So in Haskell, it was really easy because Haskell has strong static typing. The compiler knew exactly what kind of data it expected. In Clojure, we get Clojure spec. So again, we get exactly that same advantage. The program itself knows what kind of data it's generating. So it's really easy for the compiler to do all this work for you. If you're running something like Ruby, it's a little harder because you need to write the generators or the library needs to have written them for you already. So that's like the first thing to check. How good is the generator, uh, generating library and how much work are you going to have to put in to generate your own data? The second thing is any quick check library worth its salt needs to support shrinking. The, the idea behind shrinking is your computer will generate a vector. Let's say that's like a, a thousand or two thousand elements long, and it'll run some tests for you, and it'll say something went terribly wrong. Right? This test failed. That is useless for you from a programmer's perspective because now you have a four-page stack trace, and you try to figure out which element in that vector caused the problem. So what shrinking does is It'll keep pulling data out of that vector until it finds the minimum reproducible case. So it'll go from a thousand to a two element vector where the test is still failing. And it'll say, these two elements in this vector, when you run this function, this is the expected result, this is the real result. Go and figure it out. So basically, it's this, QA, it's this automated QA that always finds the minimum reproducible case. Right? The third thing that you need to figure out is how do you write tests that are generic, right? We're all used to, I, th I think we're pretty much all used to writing unit tests and, and TDD and stuff like that, right? I think I'm getting nods, yes. So over time, we've learned how to write unit tests in the sense of things like, if you're working with strings, you know to always test the, the blank, like an empty string, or that weird Japanese uh, Unicode character that always seems to break in production. If you're working with numbers, you always know to test zero and max integer and things of that nature, and a really small epsilon float, right? Basically, this is stuff that they don't teach you in school, and it's not obvious. It's just things that you were burned in production, and so you always remember to check that now, 
Well, general property testing is no different in the sense that you learn certain ways, uh, certain patterns and ways of thinking about your tests because you no longer have the luxury of knowing what your output is. Because your computer will generate random test cases and you need to write truths about your system that are always true. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to share a spend a couple of minutes to sort of show you guys some kind of like the most obvious patterns of how to write generative property testing. So get your gears working in the right direction. So to put your, you know, like on the fast track to do, you know, to fast track to success, as I would say. Agreed? Sounds good? So the first pattern is that sometimes you have operations where if you do it once or you do it multiple times, it doesn't matter. It's a no-op, right? Once you've sorted a list, no matter how many times you sort it again, it should always return true. Uh, it, it should always return the same value. But it turns out there's lots of operations where this by accident is not true, as in your sort is not stable, and your, com your compiler will find this really weird edge case because it generated this input data that you would have never thought of, right? So that's your first kind of, that's your first pattern of looking at your system as a whole. Another one is that sometimes it's hard to write uh, a test. For example, how would you write a generic test for reverse? Well, the, the, the value, the return value is always going to be different. You can't write it based on any kind of logic. But it turns out you can really easily write something like this. You can say, if I reverse something and then I reverse it again, I should get the original value back. And it turns out that there's lots of things in your system that have this uh, functionality, right? Basically, all your serializers work like this, right? If you have a JSON serializer, what you can do is you can say, generate me any arbitrary acceptable data in my system, run to JSON from JSON, and I should get the original value back, right? P easy peasy. Let your compiler run millions of examples. It will find that weird edge case that you would not have thought of because we're just not that cynical. We're not that good at coming up with tests. Another one is sometimes it's hard to f uh, write a test for something because it's complex. But it turns out that you have a base model you can work off of, right? So if I was to write a, fa a new sorting algorithm, I wouldn't write millions of unit tests. What I would do is I would say, generate me millions of units, uh, generate me millions of examples, and make sure that fast sort always works like the system sort, right? Or, or some other model. Come up with a simple model that you test against and make sure that those two always return the same values. Now, this is, again, something that is more applicable than you think. For example, when you create that new REST API that's supposed to replace the old one that has the same semantics, but it's supposed to be a lot faster, what you do is you don't write millions of unit tests because you're always going to forget that one weird business case. What you do is you deploy the new API to your cloud somewhere on the side, and you set up your routing in such a way that your requests always go to the old API to serve you know, business traffic, but they also hit the new API. And what you do is you let it run for a couple hours, couple days, or whatever, and basically you test in your production code that for all the business cases that, you exp uh, that are actually in production, your new API is always returning the exact same results as the old API. Now, the old API, mi API might have the bug, or the new API might have a bug, but it doesn't matter. What's gonna, what you're going to find out is whether your two APIs work exactly the same. If they don't, then an issue is somewhere, right? Do you want to port back the, the, the bug or not, right? Like Microsoft would just port back all the issues. So that's another nice thing that you can do. So sometimes it turns out that just systems are really complex and you, you don't even know where to start. So a really nice one is you sometimes just write a bunch of axioms about your system as a whole from a business domain perspective. So let's say you're a Facebook engineer and working on the front end. You have a bunch of business, ru business rules you don't realize you have. For example, Facebook friends are always bi-directional. If I'm your fa friend on Facebook, he, uh, that person is also my friend. It's always a two-way, right? It's not like Twitter. So you write out this kind of axiom about your system. You say, f you know, Facebook friendship is always two-way. So the same amount of set, the, the set of friends in this always has to match the set of friends in this because they're two-directional. And then you just generate a bunch of, uh, a bunch of mutations in your system. So, for example, we do things like we have a way to say these are all the valid operations the user can do in the system, and we let the computer just generate various timelines and say, imagine he just clicked through the website, you know, through all these 20 pages and stuff. Make sure that all these axioms that I want to be true about my system always hold, hold, hold true. And we found really weird bugs in this way, in the sense that there was one widget that had some local state for performance reasons that almost always updated correctly, but in some weird race condition, the local state didn't get updated correctly. 
you're never going to write that unit test because you're just not that crazy. But your computer is really good at generating lots of data. So let your computer do that work for you. Which sort of brings me to this one. This is my favorite uh, way of testing systems. And this is a way to test distributed systems. And we all build distributed systems. So this is something I stole from John Hughes. John Hughes, by the way, has, uh, except for the fact that he invented QuickCheck and he works at a company that basically makes their, all their money testing things like, um, you know, uh, rocket ships and, and uh, cars and other stuff using exactly these algorithms. Um, he also gives really nice talks. So he gave a talk about how he found bugs in Dropbox and Erlang in, as a distributed system. And what he did was, well, distributed systems are hard, right? And they're eventually consistent. So it's really hard to write a generic test that's not, uh, that's not based on a specific you know, sample data. Like this is the input to the data, and that's the expected output. You can't write that test because you, you let your system generate random things, random mutations in your system. But you could write a very different kind of test. So what he did was he said, I have, here's my list of valid operations, right? Generate a random timeline. Just, you know, just pretend you're a random user clicking on a single timeline and just generate a bunch of events. That's the mutation of my system. And now take this as the baseline. And what you now do is generate a bunch of clients randomly. Like say, there, pretend there's two clients or 10 clients or 100 clients. That, that's your distributed system, right? Random number of clients. And distribute, it, distribute that linear timeline between the clients, right? So pretend you took a, a linear timeline and then you convert it into something where a lot of different actors were acting on the system at once. And now do this multiple times, right? So generate one universe and then generate a second universe and a third universe and a fourth universe and universes. And you cannot say absolutely nothing about the end result of a single universe because it, it generated a bunch of events. But what you could say is all those universes, for example, are eventually consistent. So you end up squashing them later and making sure that after they run all their parallel code and linearly, all the universes match up. And using this kind of approach, he's shown that Dropbox actually deletes a lot of your data by accident. By the way, do not store Git repos in Dropbox because it will drop stuff. Because it's really, it's really bad at keeping large amounts of small files that change constantly. And he's also found a bug, for example, in Erlang virtual machine that was there for many, many years. And once in a while, people got psych faults, and they had no idea why. The, the, the end result was this kind of race condition you would never write a unit test for because it included a timing attack. Like, timing attacks was part of the, the test case that was generated by the computer, right? Like, how many seconds do we wait before we generate this next thing, right? This is stuff you will never test. So let your computer do it for you. So I've been talking for a really long time, but it seems like I haven't said anything. So I wanted to show you guys one more thing, which is a um, really fast uh, summary of how we build front ends. So what we do is the input to our system is chaos, and we order that chaos using EAVT, which is a data log. Uh, so anybody who has not heard of data log, I highly recommend you go and check it out. I, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover this. But you just have to take my word for it that entity attribute value time as a four uh, element tuple is enough to model any system you have. Inclu it's, it's, a, it's a linear thing you put in a queue and it's able to model graphs and relationships and everything else. It's, it's brilliant. So this is how we put order into the chaos that comes into our system. And once we have that order, remember we come back to the idea, this was the stream part and this is the tree part, right? So uh, UIs are just a, tr a tree of data. A each component in our system basically has two things. It has a query and a render. The render returns a tree of data. That, that's a tree. And the query uses a graph to query for data that it then needs to use in that render function. So the render does this, something very simple, which is it basically just returns a tree, in this case, of, of actual you know, DOM elements, like virtual DOM elements, which, of course, gets you know, composed up into actual components. But the components also get composed into a final tree. So the root element is a representation of the root of your HTML tree in this case, right? And you can always know exactly what your entire web page looks like. There's no surprises. The query is different because the query is data log, and the query lets you do things like, in this case, traversing, uh, traversing into a different part of the graph with edges. This part, it shows how to do parameterization of queries, 
because oftentimes you need to do things like that. By the way, what I'm showing is data log, and data log is basically a better GraphQL. So if you're ever interested in GraphQL, stop doing that. Just do data log. <laughs> this, uh, this is an example of how to do um, uh, a branching. Right? This is polymorphism. So a dashboard item is either a post or a photo. Post and photo have very different uh, data that are required for the rendering, but you abstract it out into a polymorphic thing called dashboard item that is then used by the dashboard. And then the dashboard itself uses, uh, it gets composed up into the root, and the end result is that the root has both the, the final uh, re representation of the virtual DOM and also the final single query that needs to be sent to the uh, backend to get all of the data it needs to render itself. The mutations are done as a, set, as a stream of data, as a pure stream of data, right? It's just uh, some name for a mutation that we have in the system, like an event, and then just some arbitrary data that's needed for its uh, completion. But what's really nice about this is it turns out that add post is just data. Reconcile, it just takes the mutations and creates a new snapshot of the world. So it's a pure function that goes from data to data. Query is a pure function that takes that snapshot of the world that's a, a vector, that data log vector, and converts and uses a graph query to convert it into the things you're interested in. And then render returns a data structure of tree of data. So this is all pure, which is nice because, first of all, it means that you can test each of these things in a pure way. But even more interestingly, you can do integration testing purely, right? Because from, to get from here to here, I never need to run a browser, right? I can do all this headless. This is just pure functions. And even better, if I put specs between these different parts, my specs can actually, ver my actually, my specs can actually verify that the thing runs correctly. And if I spec out this part and this part, I actually have tests that basically run automate, uh, generic, generative integration tests. So that thing I was talking about, or pretend you just do arbitrary random mutations in the system and make sure that the end result matches the universe I expect. So the way we do front-end testing is we do it all without ever running in the browser. The only thing you really need your browser for is CSS, right? Because you can't test CSS sensibly without running in the browser. So I wanted to really quickly just show you one thing, which is everyone knows to do MVC, yes? So this is to the MVC, and we sort of uh, modified it a little because what happens is, so we have this we have this thing here basically that's just the spec of the different things in to dos, right? Titles, completions, itself. It's just data that gets rendered at the end. So I have this function here called next, and what it does is over here on the bottom we have the data that generates this view, right? It's completely a pure function. So I have this button called next, and what happens here is every time I click it it's going to generate arbitrary data and render it. And it turns out this is a brilliant way of testing CSS because I can really quickly go through like millions of cases and find a weird edge bug, a weird bug where like, you know, the CSS is slightly off. Now obviously this is not really nice data because it, it looks like crap because it's your standard string uh, specification. But that's the nice thing about, um, sorry, I can't type it one hand, let's just do it like this. But that's the nice thing about, about the specs is they're not attached to the data itself. So at any time you can modify it. So now I've modified it so the titles are lorem ipsums, right? Which is, which is something that's more coherent, that, that more represents what the actual UI would look like. So yeah, so that was to the MVC. That's basically the end of my talk. I just have a couple slides if people are interested in, in certain things. Uh, I once gave a talk about why you should do closure script with React. Someone's interested. Um, Derek gave a much better talk about why you should use ClojureScript, if you're interested. Uh, I once gave a talk about how do you do data-oriented architecture. So that thing I was talking about from a, like a big, why, why you shouldn't do microservices, basically. Why you should replace microservices with this. Um, Martin Kleppman gives a much better talks about Apache SAMHSA, which basically shows that exact same thing, which is how to build big systems using exactly these approaches. Uh, this is one of John Hughes' talks from uh, where he shows why Dropbox loses your data, right? Using these exact uh, these things I was talking about with the, with the quick check, and you should all learn data log. This website helps you learn data log in about four hours with your favorite whiskey or beer. If anyone tells me they can learn all of SQL in four hours, I will not believe you. But you can actually learn all of data log in four hours, minus the pull API. But that's something newer. If if you get this far, just ping me, and I will tell you where to learn more. 
And if you've ignored everything I've said up to this point, just go and watch this one talk. Just, that's it. This, this is the one talk you need to watch, if nothing else, right? And I, th I think that's, that's all my slides. So yeah, thank you. Any questions? I don't know if we... Yeah.